Hello, my name is Sean Ennis from Ennis Management and thank you for joining me here on the Creative Collective and today I'm joined by a very special guest. He's a recording artist, singer, songwriter, performer from South Mountain, Ontario, Corey M. Coons. Hello, how you doing Sean? Thanks for having me. Hey, not a problem. Thank you for joining me. So, Pleasure. So talk to me about the music scene in Ontario. Well, uh, like I'm just south of Ottawa, Ontario, actually, and um, the scene is, is pretty good. Uh, it used to be quite lucrative in the you know in years gone by, but uh, things have changed somewhat. There's still a lot of pretty cool festivals that happen though in the summertime. Uh, the club scene has changed quite a bit. Um, it's uh, probably more for the tribute acts and stuff. I mean, there's still a lot of original artists out there, definitely. Um, but some of the smaller towns around the local area here where I'm from have kind of grown as well. Places like Kempville, which is, you know, 20 minutes south of Ottawa, and they have the big Kempville Live Music Festival in the summer. Ottawa has, of course, Blues Fest, they call it, which isn't really blues music anymore, but it's still called, they use that in the name, so it's many artists from all kinds of genres of music, and that's a big festival in Ottawa. The Tulip Festival and lots of stuff like that, so. And there's a lot, a lot of uh, rich songwriters, like, rich in music, rich rich songwriters in the area that, uh, you know, are working out there, so. Now, what genre of music do you consider your work to be? I would say I am sort of melodic rock meets roots rock, and uh, with a little bit of blend of country rock thrown in there, so. And how long have you been practicing your craft? Well, I started playing music at about the age of 13 and I'm sort of past my mid 40s now so so it's been a long time I started as a bass player back in uh, like I said when I was 13 years old so I think I was in the seventh grade and uh, so it's been a long time and then I kind of always play I played bass for 12 years and some professional cover bands and went on the road in the uh, in northern Ontario and then also the southeast of the uh, United States in the later 90s and did some traveling and touring as a bass player and then sort of, when I left the road, I guess it was the late, late 90s, 1999 or so, started focusing more on my own writing and solo material. I actually had a, my first recording project was my band called Tycoons, which is like sort of a retro classic rock band. And it sort of started as an original outfit, but then sort of developed into more of a, of a cover band over the years in order to kind of keep making money at it. So, but then I released my own solo stuff in 2004, that was my first solo album I released called From the Ground Up. Just released independently here in uh, sort of the eastern Ontario region. And, and uh, just actually re-released a, a retrospective of mine earlier this year too, which was sort of contains music from 1999 right through to 2010. So, so I kind of go back quite a few years and been doing it for a while. And so you started playing the bass at 13. Were you taking music lessons or self-taught? I was self-taught. I never really took a lot of music lessons, only just whatever there was in school, like, you know, music class in school, which is where I was introduced to the bass and stuff. And one of my teachers at the time brought in the bass, and I was the first one to put my hand up and run up to the front and start playing the bass. So other than that, I really didn't take any lessons. It was all self-taught. I had, had an ear for music, I guess, from a young age. And started playing bass and learning songs, learning lots of 70s and 80s melodic hair bands. <laughs> and can you talk about some of your experiences touring uh, initially as a bass player? Yeah, I first toured Northern Ontario with a band um, that I joined that was from Cornwall, Ontario, which isn't too far from where I'm from here. And we, um, we did like a two and a half month Northern Ontario tour sort of from like the fall into early winter and that was quite the experience back in the day in the early 1990s around 1992-93 and uh, we hit a lot of small towns in northern Ontario and played a lot of bars five long-haired rock and roll guys in a big black bus driving around hitting small towns and playing cover songs you know some stuff like that and then later in the 90s I joined another group that toured in the in the southern United States and we they were called Us and um they were from Ottawa originally too, but they kind of made their way down south and they're still there today, actually, those guys. And sort of around, I think it was the Alabama area that they were sort of called their stopping grounds when they got down there. So 
and uh, played with those guys for the better part of 19, 1998, I think it was. And just I was a bass player again, and uh, we did a lot of frat houses and clubs and uh, places like Panama City Beach for spring break. Some pretty pretty crazy times back when I was a single individual. And so, being that you did get your start so young, when when you started playing uh, bass at 13, did you initially think, okay, um, this is just a hobby, or this is something I'd like to pursue as, as a lifelong career? I think when I pretty much started playing bass and decided that I wanted to be a bass player right off the bat, that I kind of knew... I, because I was in sports, I was in stuff like, you know, ice hockey here in Canada, organized ice hockey, and I, you know, I played, like, softball in the summertime and football at school sort of thing, and so I kind of was like, okay, am I going to kind of go the sports route, or am I going to go, like, play music, and then once I got a bass guitar in my hands and started listening to all this music, it was just like, yeah, I think this is sort of where the path is leading me right now. I kind of knew, I mean, I you know, just always wanted to play with, play in bands, and kind of come up with my own ideas. I started writing like little ideas. I always played acoustic guitar too at the same time. So it was bass, bass more so within bands and stuff, but I always, you know, kind of wrote little ideas at home on my acoustic guitar as I learned to do that. And sang little melodies into like old tape recorders back in the day. And I still have some of those tapes. It's funny to go back and listen to them. So but I think I knew pretty young when I would, that's kind of what I wanted to follow. And, and you're pretty much completely self-taught. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, just with the exception of learning a few things from other like peers and friends of mine who you know played instruments and played guitar and bass and stuff. Other than that, just I pretty much learned all of the cover songs that I would learn on the bass just by listening to old tapes and stuff. And back in those days, there was no internet actually to get like tabs and stuff or like cheap music off of you know like there is today. So wow, that is amazing. So when you were when you were uh, touring. Um, it got to a point where you said, okay, I want to make some solo original music. Can you kind of take me through that process? Yeah, I think I just kind of, I had done the traveling and playing cover music for long enough that I just, I knew that I needed to, uh, to branch out my horizons. And I always had that original element inside of me and that I wanted to create music and melodies and songs. So I think by the point of, like I said, at the end of the 1990s, I was really, I'd already been starting writing my own songs, like I said, in high school, leading up to like going on the road just after I left high school, like after like a half a year of college or something, I think that's when I first went on the road, 19 years old. But um, so once I knew that uh, the original ideas were kind of coming through strong, I made that, made that change at the end of the 90s and just started playing more guitar, and writing a lot more lyrical ideas with the guitar, chord structures, and all that sort of thing. Wrote my first album, like I said, it was called Tycoons, which is like a classic rock sort of feel, very melodic, you know, Bon Jovi influenced, and all that sort of stuff, and sticks. And so that was in uh, late 1999 when I did that, and from then on, like I said, from 2004, I just started creating stuff as a solo artist, and kept plugging away with that up to today. What inspires you to make music? I think passion is my number one. I mean, I'm just, it's just always been my passion. So that's, that creates an inspiration. And then other music, other artists obviously are, you know, big factors in that. And um, sometimes it's just my surroundings, ideas that may just flow and ideas that pop into your head and say, oh, that's I've got an idea for a melody here. I may just start humming a melody in my head, you know, and not even have lyrics or words for it. And later on, just kind of write down, fill in the blanks of what I hear as the melody and then form the words around that. Or other times I'll have really cool riffs on a guitar, patterns that I've been working on or chord structures, and then sort of start developing that as far as I can and then sort of bring in the lyrical element after. Try to tell a story too, you know. That leads me right into my next question. How important is storytelling in your music? I think it's very important. I think you you can't always write everything that's like totally from the heart, I guess. You have to kind of come up with ideas that are going to hit people that tell that story that someone can pick up on and resonate with. Um, 
can't always be about personal things, you know, although I do have a few personal songs that really touch home to myself. And uh, one that I wrote uh, for my parents on my Share a Little Time EP it was called Remember Me, and basically my dedication to them, because they both passed on now. So that was my dedication to them, so that was very personal. And I wrote one a few years ago for my daughter on her second birthday. She's now five, but I wrote one as a sort of like little song for her. So family is sometimes inspirational too, and uh, just different things. It depends on the, the day. Now, what is it like writing songs that are really personal that you know that you're going to share with the world? Well, it's hard sometimes because you're bearing yourself or your soul to the world, I guess, in a way. And you know, whoever's going to listen, you know, so it's it tends to be very personal. So that's why I say I think if you're if you're truthful and you're honest and it's real, then you shouldn't really have anything to worry about because you know people are going to relate to that. I think and they're going to see it. If you're trying to force something and it just doesn't become real anymore, I think, you know, that's when things maybe kind of tend to take a long turn or something maybe, but it just, it depends. It's a different thing for different people and different songwriters, so it's hard though. It's, um, for me, like, changing over from being a bass player and just a harmony singer back in the day to becoming more of a front man and the lead vocalist, it's like, you're like, it's just you and it's everybody else and you're the focal point almost and it's like, it's, it's nerve-wracking for a while until you kind of just decide, you know, this is this is the path, and this is what I want to say, and people are going to accept it or they're not. You're not going to please everybody. You have to write for yourself, number one, but then, you know, hopefully it will resonate with most of the people who feel that message and accept it. <laughs> and that's really, um, it's really interesting. So what, what gave you the confidence and the courage to really step out there um, on your own as, as, as like the, you know, a, a solo artist. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, uh, there's always that fear element, so sometimes I wonder, because uh, I was a very nervous kid in, like, public school. I hated public speaking. I just couldn't get up in front of the class. I'd shake, like, beliefs. But you put a guitar or a bass in my hands, and it was a total different ballgame. Like, music just, just kind of came through me, and so, I mean, I don't know how else to explain it other than it's my passion and I hope that uh, I don't know I hope that people can accept it I guess and, and understand where artists come from when they try to create something it's not easy I completely agree I mean um, being being an artist someone who creates something and then puts it out on the world for for display you're you're in such a vulnerable position Exactly. I mean, you're open to the criticisms, you know, and uh, and the ones who like it. So you, it's kind of like both spectrums there, you know. So you just try to, like I say, you just, I do what I do. I know certain people will, will like it, just like certain music that I like. Maybe there's some music that I'm not so fond of or whatever, but I mean, I'm, I'm kind of open to everything, and I always try to find the best out of everything that I hear or that I see as far as art and music and film and movies and all that stuff, you try to find something good about something, or otherwise, what's the point, right? So. Now, can you briefly describe the music-making process? Music-making as far as the recording or the writing, or...? Both. Both? Well, I don't have a real process. I've been asked this before with my songwriting. I don't have that cookie-cutter sort of style of, like, every song is going to be created a certain way. You know, like that number one hit sort of formula that maybe you go to classes and you take how to songwrite 101 or whatever but I just kind of everyone's different I mean it's kind of what I feel and uh, it's emotional sometimes and um, I just think I let the ideas and the songs take me somewhere and let them guide me other than me trying to guide the outcome because that can be forced and then sometimes it just may not go where you even think it's cool for yourself or you just don't feel it anymore. I think you just kind of let that, let it take you somewhere and then hopefully it'll be the right direction. As far as recording goes, I mean, you, it's just different styles of recording. There's different aspects of how you approach recording. You know, I've worked in different studios over the years and each one sort of a, each project and each album is a different sort of uh, process. So 
But normally it's like, you know, you start creating, you try to lay down drum tracks and bass tracks and get that solid foundation down, and then you build a song around that with your overdubs later on. And unless, of course, you're going in as a live unit and you're recording live off the floor, then you try to get that whole live feeling in there. But the way things have changed in the recording industry anymore, it's, it's very tough to do that with time management to get everybody on board, you know, so... Yeah, could you could you talk about that? The challenges of, of trying to record live with, with multiple people, multiple instruments? Yeah, um, my last album actually, The Long Road Home, the process for that was actually four guys like myself and my friend Mark Muir on guitar. And we went to uh, um, Vancouver, Washington to, to work with Ron Nevison on the last one. And we had two session guys from the local Portland area, Portland, Oregon, which borders right there. And uh, Ron brought in a bass player and a drummer, it's great guys, and um, they basically, we, we did it, we set up as a, as a band in the studio, and we each had our own, you know, sort of headphones, and we, we tracked our parts. While you record drums and bass, everybody's playing together, but you're basically focusing on tracking, you know, drums first and then bass, but everybody's playing together while somebody is recording their parts, so everything's, there's no leakage out of separate tracks so you're only hearing drums that get recorded and then you go back later and you do the bass second and then you do guitars and then you do vocals so but it started off as kind of that's how ron works because ron is very old school as a producer so and i love that element of like the way they used to do things in the 70s and 80s right go anywhere to find a sound you need and set up in anywhere from like a barn to like a swimming pool or something to get drum sounds or whatever they would do in the old days so that's cool you know now can you talk about uh, Ron, some of the work he's done in the past, and, and how the work that you two have done together, and how you guys came together? Yeah, like I said before, he uh, he's produced from way back in the like, 1970s, and like he did stuff with Led Zeppelin. He worked on Bad Company's albums. The Who, excuse me, The Who he worked with. Um, into the 80s, he worked with people like Kiss on the Crazy Nights album, Heart on their two big 80s rock hit albums that they had, um, Survivor on one of their albums, Night Ranger, Damn Yankees on their two multi-platinum albums that they did. So he's he's the guy, you know, he was sort of like a dream producer for me to work with because that was very much my, a lot of my influences was that very melodic rock sound, you know, growing up. So I definitely wanted to work with him. So when I got the chance, I'd been sending him some ideas just on some social platforms, like through, you know, stuff like Sonic Bids with your EPK, and you send music out to people in the industry and stuff like that. And Music X Ray, I was sending ideas and just sending him messages and saying, you know, what do you think of these songs? And he'd always get back to me and he'd say, oh, I like that, I like this, and I like that. But we didn't really hook up for about a year or two after I first connected with him, you know, online. And then one day I just said, well, hey, I think we could get together and, and work on a project. And he said, yeah, he said, for sure. He says, right now I'm just kind of moving between. Uh, I think it was Beverly Hills to San Francisco he was moving from at the time. That was in about two, 2013. And uh, so once he got sort of situated, he got back to me and said, well, so what do you want to do? And I said, well, let's let's do like an EP. Let's do three songs. And uh, he said, okay. So he suggested working in Hollywood at uh, Bovaland, Bovaland, B-O-V-A, Studios with Jeff Bova, who's a Grammy, Grammy Award winning uh, producer as well and a ranger. So we worked on with him to start with in uh, Hollywood, starting tracking those three songs for Share a Little Time. And then we moved from there to Tim Pierce's studio, and Tim Pierce is the guitar player who was with, uh, um, we played on Bon Jovi's original hit way back in the day, the first one, Runaway. Tim Pierce was on that, and he also played with Rick Springfield. So he's a top session player in LA, and uh, so Tim Pierce played some guitar on my album then too, off sorry, the EP. And from there we went to San Francisco and we played, uh, we recorded at Laughing Tiger Studios. We did the rest of my vocals and my guitars and finished up tracking everything there. So that was the initial project I got to work with him, like I said, back in 2014. And then I was fortunate enough later on that year to get nominated for the LA Music Awards. So it was a pretty cool year. And now, what, what sort of, um, what did you learn or what sort of takeaways did you get from being able to work with people who have, you know, really had historical music careers or, or worked with people who have had historical music careers? Well, you know what? They could have been, like, nicer people. 
people to work with. I mean, you know, with Jeff Bova and Tim Pierce and Ron is super amazing to work with. They're so, you know, very professional, obviously. And it was this A team of players that he calls, you know, like he's not going to work with people with just, you know, fly by nighters or anything like that. These guys are top, top notch musicians, you know. So, so that's, you know, you know you're going to have a good product at the end of it all, which is very professional. That's what I was looking for. And I think the experience was just amazing for me going as a solo artist. You know, I didn't really bring a band with me because I've worked with bands over the years, but kind of kind of made it a family vacation at the same time because my wife at the time, my wife, well, my current wife, but at the time, my wife and I went to, uh, to California with my sister and brother-in-law as well, and they kind of made that a vacation, and I got to work in studios. So it was a vacation and a recording project all in one for me. So it was, it was just a great experience. Now... Can you talk to me about the Share a Little Time EP? Yeah, as far as the songs? Yeah, to kind of take me through the process of how, how that project came together. Well, just kind of like what I was saying, we went to uh, Hollywood and we tracked at Overland Studios and I basically brought in my my three songs. Ron and I had kind of went over. I think we, had a, we narrowed it down to like five originally and then we cut it down to the three that I wanted to do for the EP. So I picked out of the five songs, we picked the three strongest that we thought were, you know, best to work on. And so I took them in, and uh, basically I had my arrangements ready to go. So we laid down, like, guitar tracks, we called them scratch tracks, and uh, built a foundation with that. And then Jeff Bova at the time would kind of build things around it, like instrumentation, with, you know, keyboard arrangements, and some string arrangements, a beautiful string arrangement he did on Remember Me, one for my parents. And, uh, you know, we... For that album, we actually we, um, we did some programming on bass guitar and stuff like that, so it wasn't a full live band on that, but like I said, the, the later album, The Long Road Home, that I just did last year was full band production, full live instruments and everything, so so that process was slightly different on Share a Little Time than The Long Road Home, because I really kind of wanted to get to that more live band feel again on the latest one. So. And can, can you expand on that? Why, why did you feel that was important? And I like when you when you continue to carry out your music and play it live, and you have your your band. It's it's just such a great feeling when you're you know you're bouncing the ideas back and forth and you're vibing with the guys on stage. And just I have always been a big fan of the live the live feel with a band. And you know if you can get that in the studio as close as you can these days, I think that's pretty cool. You know because the way like I said earlier, the way it's changed is. A lot of times, you know, it's hard to do that, but the way we did it was pretty cool because the, the basic meat and potatoes of, this, of the album, the tracks that were done, were done with four guys in a room and then kind of going back later and doing some overdubs. And then we came back here to actually uh, to Cornwall, Ontario, where Mark lives, my guitar player from the record. He did some overdubs here and then we would send the ideas back to Ron again eventually when he went back. When we got back home and sent them back to Ron, he mixed everything at the end, so... But for the most part, we had a lot of really cool live elements on it. Now, have you ever gone to see a performance and have been disappointed with the live performance because it didn't it, it didn't match up to the to the in studio recording? Yeah, there are, there's bands and performers out there that you know, but you can kind of guess that when you hear some of the recordings, like you can kind of say, "Gee, I don't know how they're going to pull that off." You know, it depends on how much layering there is and stuff and what how people are recording things. I like the authentic stuff, like, you know, like getting back to, like, the Tom Petty and the Heartbreaker stuff and stuff like Bon Jovi and Styx. Like, Styx is an amazing, amazing band, and they can pull those songs off live, and the vocals are just super amazing to this day. So, I mean, that, to me, is the best thing you can do and, and go to see is live entertainment where they're recreating stuff as close to the record as you can get, you know, and with a little bit of uh, a little bit of room to play there. But I mean, for the most part, it's great. But there, I mean, yeah, there's bands out there. I can't, I can't really name any offhand that I can think of. But I've seen footage of bands and stuff that maybe shouldn't be shouldn't be doing it anymore. Some of them, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now talk to me about the song "Break the Fall." What's that song about? Yeah, that's a romantic sort of ballad, um, sort of about heartbreak and loss. Kind of talks about uh, that one that got away. You know, that's everybody has that sort of person, I guess, in their life. Maybe one that gets away on you or something. Um, you know, 
it talks also about the power of, of words, you know, brings a belief in truth and change. So that's sort of my sort of my uh, take on the song. But like I said, I like to leave that mystery there for people. So I think some most people get that sort of romantic tale out of it. But there might be some other ideas that people get out of that too. So. And and three uh, these three latest singles. Are you um? Did you do all the writing for these songs? Yes, they're all uh, original songs. Um, there's the exception of Would You Stay, which just the outro section of Would You Stay was co-written with my friend Mark. He kind of came up with a little outro arrangement and solo stuff on the guitar. And then uh, he came up with a few of the lyrics at the end and stuff. So that was kind of a collaboration. The original version of that song, Would You Stay, was basically it was all my song. But then Mark kind of had a real cool way that we could kind of... I wanted to re-record -re that song because it was originally on an album back in 2012, just a different version of it. So I kind of I kind of heard the song in a different way and a little more like maybe a little more upbeat and an electric sounding than the way it was recorded originally. And uh, so Mark had some really cool elements that he brought to that song. So that was kind of a collaboration. But everything else on the record is all all original stuff that I wrote. You know, my sort of my arrangements and, and rhythm stuff and, and lyrical c content. And what what is the song? Would you stay about? self-described itself sort of about that you know wanting to stay and that person that you feel comfortable with and I think it kind of speaks for itself there so once again I leave that open to interpretation for everybody and now is this a song that's written from your personal experience not necessarily not really no it's been so long I've, I've been married my wife and I've been married now for like 15 16 years so not really anything about any one, one certain person or anything like that, you know. Back in high school, maybe there was stuff that I wrote, little ideas that I may go back and find that were about high school uh, romances or something, but nothing much uh, too personal about that one. Just more kind of relaying a story, I think, trying to resonate again with people. Now, once, one, uh, once too many, twice not enough. Yeah, that's sort of... Uh, I guess there's a, talks a little bit about life being a gamble, you know. If you uh, make the right choices in life, you know, you, you take that chance on the right choice. That and if it ends up being the right choice, then you think you're doing something right. So it kind of gives you that the chorus gives you that element of like that sort of taking that chance and that life is a gamble. So now, how important is it to you to have a positive message in your music? I think it's very important. Um, I don't like to dwell on negativity too much if I can help it, either in my personal life or in my music. I always try to find that, you know, that positive outcome in things. Everybody, I think, should be striving for like a positive outcome, you know. So I guess that's that's really important to me. So, but again, there's emotional songs that kind of, you know, kind of take you on a different ride, but. Hopefully, there's that positive message in there. Hope for change. Now, can you talk to me about a memorable performance? Yeah, we were chatting earlier, and um, when I was in Los Angeles in 2014 for the LA Music Awards, because I got nominated in a couple different categories, and I was fortunate enough to uh, to bring home a Producer's Choice honor for the Share a Little Time uh, EP. That was pretty exciting and pretty, pretty, uh, pretty cool to say the least. So, so to get to perform at the Whiskey a Go Go, you know, which is Los Angeles and the Sunset Strip and that whole thing that I remember from growing up and seeing all those bands and all the all the sort of mayhem that would have went down back in those days. I'm not not sure if I would have been wanting to be a part of all that or not, but but it's just so cool to to be you know around that vibe and in, in, a, in a place like that we're just going back to even like when the doors started you know bands like that that played there and just that whole legendary sunset strip was amazing so we get to be on the stage and perform three songs for the nomination night that was very very cool it's a memory i'll always remember and then getting to do the uh just to play not to play but just to to hang out at the awards later on in november that year at the avalon theater which is also in, uh, in los angeles which was very cool as well it sounds like it. It sounds like it could be a really um, 
kind of inspiring and motivating moment. Definitely. Almost surreal to someone like myself, you know. I'm the kid that came from, like, you know, up north here in Canada and getting to finally get to check out Los Angeles, you know. It was pretty surreal, and you never know who's going to walk in there. And there was people that, you know, that, that kind of come into the club and it's like, man, is this, is this for real, you know, because you, you remember some of the people that uh, you grew up listening to and stuff. Who was on the stage, so when things that are going through your mind when you're actually playing on the stage, it's like, how many of these people were on this stage, you know? Incredible. Now, how do you feel your music has evolved? I think I'm kind of more back sort of at my roots of my songwriting, a little more grounded in where I'm at with my whole songwriting career again, like sort of back to the melodic rock again. Like I said, I've had some different influences over the years and I've always really enjoyed everything that I've sort of did and, and came up with and created, but I just kind of think I'm a little more rooted again with, you know, the core of my music sort of being that melodic rock sprinkled with, you know, the roots rock in the country, a little bit of country in there, here and there. Because if you have that sort of blend of, like, country rock and, and very melodic harmonies and stuff, you know, you're getting that cross of the storytelling mixed in with very powerful guitars and very powerful drums sometimes and just a very melodic sound with good stories in there. I think that's, to me, that's a pretty cool mix, you know. Now, what's a piece of advice that you could give for an aspiring musician or a musician who's just starting out in their music career? Surround yourself with the right people. Make sure the people you work with are people you trust 100% because there's a lot of people out there that are not in it for you. They're in it for themselves in this, in this business. And uh, you have to, you're going to meet those people, but you're going to know who they are. And you're gonna, we've all been burned, I think, a little bit in our lives. And there's little things that you learn as you go along. Hopefully, hopefully recover from them and don't do it again a second time. So yeah, surrounding yourself with the right people, the right team of players that you want to help take you to the next level of your career and just be as honest and true as you can with your craft. And like I said, that's, uh, that's going to make a difference and let people know that you're real. That's some really great advice. Now, can you share your website and your social media links? Yeah, my official website is www.coreym, as in Mervyn, coons.com. So coreymcoons.com, that's the official site. And my social media links are all there. Like I said, there's Facebook. That's uh, facebook.com backslash cmc.music. And then there's uh, at coreymcoons1 for Twitter, I believe it is. And then Instagram is coreymcoonsmusic. And there's YouTube also on my website and stuff like that. So Now, is there anyone you'd like to acknowledge for offering financial or emotional support to you during your music career? Yeah, there's been a couple of um, local organizations over the years that have helped me out a little bit um, with some sort of advances on helping with some recording and different things. Like my local Alliance Club out of Iroquois, Ontario was very kind over the years. And I got to play for probably 15 years in a row for July 1st every year, which is a festival celebrating Canada's birthday. So it's called Canada, Canada Day here, which is similar to July 4th in the States, only July 1st. So so stuff like that. I mean, um, my parents obviously were so supportive before they passed on with everything I did financially and everything else. So, I mean, I just I miss them every day. So obviously they were a huge part of my life and that was a big void. And my wife and my daughter for all the family support um, that I've had from them. My wife is just unbelievable, just uh, super supportive. And uh, family's the rock. So if you don't have family, you know, uh, that's the whole thing that holds it all together. That's the glue. Is there anything else you'd like to promote or share? Uh, I'd like to also thank Michael Stover from MTS Management, uh, who I've been working with on promotions and publicity and the MTS record label. And yourself, Sean, thank you so much for having me on. And uh, just everybody out there who's supported my music, all the radio stations, all the uh, some of the, the award, you know, independent award shows and stuff that's been going on. Thank you so much to everybody for voting for different things and all the people for checking out my music. And I just appreciate it so much. Thank you. 
All right. Well, I'd like to give a very big thank you to my special guests for joining me today here on the Creative Collective. As always, write your comments below. Make sure you like, subscribe, and share this video. And for all of your promotion, marketing, and music career consulting needs, email ennisproductions at gmail.com.